Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I prepared this speech, but at 5pm I decided to scrap much of it because I wanted to express how I and many of my constituents feel. We are hurting, Mr Speaker, and I feel often that I am in this horrid dream, this nightmare. And it's a nightmare that has continued from that moment that I broke down at the referendum in tears on the result night in that count. At that moment, I felt, and I still feel now, that something had been stolen from me. Viscerally, something had been taken from me, and not for others to gain from, to be destroyed, to be torn up. And my rights, my citizenship, my culture, all had been ripped away from me and many of my constituents. And on my way home, on that miserable morning, I, of course, went to my local shop and chatted to my Spanish friend there, and all I could say was, I'm sorry, we have failed you. We, in the Remain campaign, we failed millions of migrants who work here, who live here, who made this place their home, and we have made their life less welcoming. But why should our failure, why should my failure on the campaign harm them? Why should a failure of 2016 bind our future and mean that we fail forever? There is a principle in democracy and in Parliament that no Parliament, no vote, may bind future Parliaments. There is a principle that no votes may bind future votes. The 75 vote didn't bind us in 2016. So why now do we not say that well, why now do we say for some reason the tyranny, tyranny of history should bind us to the decision that I think was a manifest mistake? Now, look, I am against referendum generally. We live in a parliamentary democracy, um, and I believe that we should avoid them if we can. But once the genie is out of the bottle, the only way of getting it back in, the only way of ending this nightmare may well end up being at the end of this long journey, whenever it is, another people's vote. And just like for many women in Ireland that lost the vote in 83, they immediately started building and working for another referendum to return and overturn that awful decision. And three subsequent referendums later, they managed to do it. In Taiwan, last, a few months ago, there was a vote to ban same-sex marriage in the Constitution, which passed, stripping people of their rights and of their identity. Do we castigate the women of Ireland for pushing to overthrow the will of the Irish? No, we celebrate the role, and right, the role of those women who overturned an historical wrong. Do we tell the LGBT people in Taiwan, no, I'm sorry, you've just got to live with the fact that you can't now marry? No, we say to them, continue fighting, continue pushing on, democratically, of course, and try and overturn that absolute wrong that has been done to you. Well, I, Mr Speaker, feel like an absolute wrong has been done to our country. An absolute wrong has been done to me. So I can tell you, I believe there is no Brexit that will be a good Brexit for Britain. It just does not exist. No government can produce a good Brexit. And yes, if Labour got in, we would limit the damage, mitigate some of the damage of this. But even then, we could not produce a good Brexit because Brexit is fundamentally linked to some xenophobic, petty, nationalist view. And that's not to say those people who voted for Brexit are xenophobic or petty nationalists. When I lived in Yorkshire and we voted, unfortunately, for a BMP MEP, and I had BMP councillors up the road from me, I didn't say the voters in those wards were xenophobic and racist. I said they had made an historic and terrible mistake, and we worked for four years, we worked for five years to make sure those people were kicked out. This is a horrible and terrible mistake that was initiated by extremists in UKIP that infected the Tory party. And we must now say that mistake must be undone. And of course people are right to say there are problems with the European Union. It is not perfect. Of course they are right to say, for example, some of the rules on state aid are problematic for us. But this deal in front of us enshrines all the same state aid rules without any of the opt-outs and agreements that you can get in the Commission. It is worse, it is far worse for the left 
this deal than remaining in the European Union. And so that is why this deal must be rejected. But that is also why we on the left must understand that staying in and reforming is the only feasible option for socialists. But we also must understand that there are some goods in things like state aid rules. They stop a race to the bottom. For example, the recent ECJ rulings against Ireland and Google means that you don't have some Dutch auction of giving tax breaks and giveaways to multinational companies. Because when we live in a global capitalist world, Mr Speaker, and we live in a system where multinational companies can, of course, have more power and more clout than many nation states, the only way that we can counter that, the only way that we can do things on climate change and other international big global things is to work together, to form a democratic union. And my God, the European Union is far more democratic than some things in this country. Just look down the road at the other place. Gareth Snell. Thank you uh, very much, Mr Speaker. It's a pleasure, Mr Speaker, to follow my honourable friend from Brighton, Kemp Town. He and I disagree on where we should be going uh, with, the result, with the answer to Brexit, but no one can doubt the passion that he has for both his community and the causes that he champions. And it is in that spirit of conciliatory debate that I wish to make my brief contributions this afternoon. I wish mainly, Mr Speaker, to speak to Amendment P that, that I have uh, tabled along with my honourable friend from Don Valley, 